Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining what promises to be an engaging evening, an exploration of the story of Terezin. I am Samantha Goldman, and I have the privilege of coordinating the Jewish Lecture Program at the Bronfman Center for Jewish Life at 92nd Street Y. The Terezin programming tonight and throughout the next month is made possible through the generosity of our donors with major funding provided by the Rita Allen Foundation and the Harold W. and Ida L. Goldstein Lecture Fund through the estate of Sanford Goldstein. 92nd Street Y relies on donor support to continue providing programs and services of the highest quality and at an affordable price, and we are grateful for their generosity. We are pleased to be webcasting this evening's program and other programs throughout our series at 92y.org slash In addition to tonight's events, 92y offers a number of panel discussions, concerts, film screenings, dance presentations, literary readings, and educational outreach to K through three public school students through 92y's music education program. I hope you will take advantage of these opportunities. I also encourage you to visit the extraordinary exhibit of art and artifacts from Theresen next door in our art gallery, where both our moderator, Ruth Franklin, and panelist, Zdenka Flintlova, will be signing their books, A Thousand Darknesses, Lies and Truth in Holocaust Fiction, and The Tin Ring, respectively, after the event. We will be collecting questions for our panel tonight on index cards here in-house. If you have questions, please write them down as legibly as possible and hand your cards back to the ushers, who will make several trips throughout the hall to collect them. Without further ado, I'm glad to begin tonight's program by introducing our acclaimed moderator for the evening. Ruth Franklin is a literary critic and a senior editor at The New Republic. Her writing also appears in The New Yorker, The New York Review of Books, The New York Times, and many other publications. Her first book, a Thousand Darknesses, Lies and Truth in Holocaust Fiction, examines the intersection between memoir and imagination in works by authors such as Elie Wiesel, Primo Levi, W.G. Sebald, and Jonathan Safran Foyer. The Atlantic hailed the book as a towering work of criticism and insight, and the tablet magazine named her one of our most important critics under 40. She is currently working on a biography of the American writer Shirley Jackson, Please join me in welcoming Ruth Franklin and our esteemed panel. Good evening, thank you for joining us this evening for this event devoted to the culture of Terezin. I'm going to introduce the panelists and then we'll have a discussion interspersed with some film clips from two of the uh, documentaries that the filmmakers on this panel have directed. <clears throat> I start with Zdenka Fantlova, closest to me, who was 19 and an aspiring actress when her family was sent to Terezin. Alongside her day job in the kitchen, she became actively involved in the camp's theater and cabaret scene. When the camp was liquidated, she was sent on the same transport to Auschwitz as most of the Terezin composers, but unlike them, she escaped the gas chambers and was sent to hard labor. She was imprisoned also in Grossrosen, Mauthausen, and Bergen-Belsen, where she was liberated by a British officer. She has told the story of her experiences in her memoir, The Tin Ring. Sidenka Fanlova later emigrated to Australia, where she has had a successful career as an actress. She now lives in London. Susanna Justman was imprisoned at Terezin with her brother and parents. In 1986, she started work on her first film, Terezin Diary, a documentary about the camp. Her 1998 documentary, Voices of the Children, which tells the story of three concentration camp survivors, received multiple awards, including the 1999 Emmy Award for Best Historical Program. Her other films include Czech Women, Now We Are Free, a look at feminism in the former Czechoslovakia, and A Trial in Prague, about a show trial in communist Czechoslovakia. 
She also adapted and produced The Unlucky Man in the Yellow Cap, a play with music by her brother, the late Czech writer J.R. Pick, which takes place in Terezin. It premiered at the 2006 New York International Fringe Festival. Susanna's film, Voices of the Children, will be screened here next Monday, January 23rd at 6 p.m. And Simon Broughton is a freelance filmmaker, journalist, and magazine editor who has worked for BBC Radio 4 as an arts producer and for BBC Television. He first visited Terezin in 1986, before the Velvet Revolution, to make a documentary for Radio 4 and then returned to the new Czechoslovakia in the early 1990s to make his film, The Music of Terezin, a co-production with the BBC and Czech TV. The film won Best Documentary Prize at Midam in Cannes in 1993 and was shown in many countries around the world. And it will be screened here this Saturday, January 21st at 6 p.m. So I'd like to start by asking you all just a couple questions to give us the general, the tenor of what life was like in Terezin. Just to give a little bit of background, the town itself was built in the late 1700s by the Austrian Emperor Joseph II as a fortress to guard Prague against invasion. It was turned into a Jewish ghetto in fall 1941. Before the war, it had around 7,000 inhabitants, and at the height of the war, there were more than 55,000 prisoners there. In addition to the musicians and composers that we'll be talking about tonight, other of the well-known prisoners include Rabbi Leo Beck and the writer H.G. Adler. So a total of around 140,000 Jews were deported to Terezin. About 33,000 died there, and 88,000 were deported to extermination camps, such as Treblinka and Auschwitz. But it was not a death camp, although everyone over 14 was forced to work between 80 and 100 hours a week, and there were severe food shortages and regular transports to death camps. So one thing I wondered if we could start with is the question, how exactly do we define Terezin, which was a camp really unlike none other? And Zenka, I wonder if you would like to begin. Was it, well, some people, we've asked the question whether, it, was it a ghetto? Was it a concentration camp? What exactly no, should we call it? No, no. Terezin originally, was a military town, it was mm -hmm. a fortress, which was built by Maria Teresa, 1780 or so, as a, as a fortress against the Prussians. Mm -hmm. And it was built, actually, and I, I think she didn't even know that, <laughs> in, a, in a sign of Jewish star. <clears throat> Little did she know. Uh, then uh, later on, it was uh, during the Czechoslovakian Republic, uh, was used as a military town to, f to house uh, soldiers and uh, military personnel, and was a small town also with inhabitants, about 5,000, mm -hmm. small town, an ordinary town. Until, and I must say, and I think it's appropriate to say that today, to the day, 70 years ago, the Germans have signed in Berlin the last chapter of the tragedy of the European Jews, final solution. Mm -hmm. And since then, uh, Terezin started to be occupied with Jews. Uh, the first ones were, of course, from Czechoslovakia, and uh, it took us by surprise overnight. We were not at all prepared. So uh, the Czech population, Jewish population, was mixed. 
men, women, children, family, everything. Later on, uh, old people from Germany came because there were not many left because they were already gone long ago or forced to go. Uh, from Austria, a uh, few hundred from Denmark and Holland. Uh, and it was established as a, I would say, a waiting room mm -hmm. for what came later. Susanna, how would you say life in Terezin was different from most concentration camps? Uh, well, it, it's very difficult to define uh, Terezin in a, in a brief period because uh, in, a, in its four-year existence, it underwent so many changes. The Nazis uh, changed, uh, changed their mind about what the camp should be, whether it was a camp for old people or whether it was to be presented to the outside world as a model camp, or if it was just to uh, hide the idea of clearing uh, the former Czechoslovakia of all Jews. They, they couldn't send them directly to Poland because uh, there were not enough camps. In 1941, when Terezin began, was, uh, became a, get a ghetto, I'm calling it a ghetto now. Now, whether to call it a ghetto or a concentration camp, I think, I think it's been, by scholars, it's been called both. The fact is, we were talking about before whether it was a prison or not. To me, it was a prison because we couldn't leave. Uh, but it's, it's difficult to talk about Terezin in a brief period because it, it, it changed so many times. But I wanted to make one point also, that it was different for different groups of people. Uh, some young people, especially those that worked in kitchens and could eat as much as they wanted, and sometimes did a little bit of schleusing, schleus to schleus meant to, to steal, but it was a Terezin expression for stealing, which was, which was not frowned upon. It was stealing from the common property, not from other prisoners. So young people who worked in kitchens and had lots of food were really not that badly off. But it was, if you contrast their life to those of the old people, then there was a huge difference. The old people uh, lived in dreadful conditions and many of them died. When you said that one quarter of the people that uh, passed through Terezin died there, they were mostly old people who died of starvation and disease. Simon, could you say something briefly about the unique cultural life that took place in Terezin? Yeah, I, I think ghetto is a good word for, for Terezin. Um, it was, strictly speaking, a concentration camp because people were concentrated there. But I think when you say concentration camp, you get pictures in your mind of Auschwitz and fences and spotlights and, and all of that, which, which isn't exactly what Terezin was. And Terezin was unique, which is why <coughs> this week exists here, why, why these concerts, why these films um, are being shown, because the circumstances were unlike anywhere else. So uh, it was possible for people to be creative and to create extraordinary things in these very extreme circumstances. So there isn't anywhere else like it. And what's remarkable is that Terezin was one of the most creative places in Nazi-occupied Europe. Um, and ironically, also one of the freest places in Nazi-occupied Europe. In a minute, we're going to take a look at a couple of clips from Susanna's film, Voices of the Children, which is a, what tells the story of three mainly of three survivors of Terezin. And I wondered if we could just start by, with you talking a little bit about how you came to make this film. Well, I, I had made a film about Terezin before called Terezin Diary, which was the story of Terezin. But I was not completely happy with that film and wanted to tell the story of three people and, and delve into their lives, not just during the war, but covering the post-war period into the present and to 
uh, also examine their relationship with their children, which tends to be very complicated uh, with child survivors. Every family deals with the past in a different way. Some parents talk about the Holocaust constantly, and some parents never tell their children uh, what happened to them. Michael Krause, who's in my film, uh, when we filmed him, he told me that he had never described any of his experiences to either his wife or his children. And his daughter, Dana, who was at that time in medical school, took the opportunity of the filming to confront her father. And while I just asked them if we could film them having lunch, she suddenly said to her father, you can't pretend that it, meaning the Holocaust, didn't affect us. How did you choose these three survivors? Well, I, I knew Helga Kinski was in my, who lives in Vienna now and who kept a wonderful diary. She was a gifted writer as a child. She was in my, in my previous film. And I think that she is a very good witness. She, well, you will see her in one of the clips. She's a very warm, charming person, and she is very truthful, you can see. You, you, you can connect with her. And the other, per, uh, the other woman is another Helga, Helga Hoshkova, who is rather well known as an artist. She, she made, well, we will see this in the clip. She grew up to be an artist, and her, the 10 drawings that she made in Terezina are shown all over the world. Can you move your microphone just a little bit closer? Yeah, good. And so diaries play a very important role in your film. The diaries of these three survivors often are read in voiceover in the background. Could you talk a little bit about diaries, the, the diaries that were kept in Yes, the I chose the three people in my film uh, because they had diaries. I, they had diaries, they made pictures. They also all went to Auschwitz and wanted since they were representing the Terezin children, and most Terezin children went to Auschwitz, I wanted all three to have gone there. I wanted them to have diaries because uh, I, it's a documentary film, and I wanted to have as much documentation as possible. And also, I think uh, the, uh, the film is full of these three people's reading from their diaries, and I think it brings an immediacy to the, to the presentation that I like very much. Good, so let's have the first film clip, please. We're going to see Helga Hoshkova talking about her drawings. I think that the father was a very powerful man. It was an authority that was recognized that what he said, and I was convinced that it was right. I was even convinced of it until today. Because my father was a very educated man. And if it comes to the Kresby Terezinsk, I was really with my father. We always said that this is interesting, that this would be able to do. So it opened my eyes to where I should have been concerned about. Ty kresby mám už 50 let skovaný v tomhle gauči, protože já jsem vždycky měla volně strachy mít někde i ve svém ateliéru nebo kdekoliv, aby se mi nestratili a zdálo se mi, že nejistější budou tady, já jsem na nich doslova celý ty leta spala. A tadyhle bych se snad pozastavila nad touhle první kresbou. Ta má takovou svoji historii, protože tohle byla moje první kresba, kterou jsem nakreslila, když jsem přijela do Terezína. Tuhle tu kresbu jsem poslala tatínkovi a tatínek mě na to tehdy odpověděl, maluj, co vidíš. A já jsem tím skončila nejen, myslím, svoje dětské malování, ale vlastně tím skončilo i moje dětství, protože jsem začala pozorovat a vidět svět kolem sebe a na základě toho vzniklo teda ta kolekce těch 100 kreseb, které zachycují život v Terezíně.
No a když jsem se vrátila, pak jsem malovala dál, až jsem se rozhodla, že se tomu budu věnovat profesionálně. A to váleční téma jsem se sice několikrát snažila opustit, ale nějak se k tomu neustále a neustále vracím. A vlastně je to pořád ještě nějak ve mně a asi to tam už zůstane. So what really jumps out of me about this particular clip, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is the way Helga Hoshkova talks about this imperative to draw what you see. Do you think that that was one of the primary motivations for artists in Terezin, or were there other motivations as well? Well, um, perhaps we could discuss it a little bit later after we see the clip with Helga Kinski. Sure. If you don't mind. Sure. Because it contrasts with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. But I guess I just wanted to draw attention to that the, the artist as chronicler as being one of the one of the one of the important roles that were fulfilled by art in the camp, but not necessarily the only role. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Simon, do you have anything to say about the if I may just yes. add Many, uh, many artists in, in Terezin, I think, were motivated by their desire to document what was going on. And uh, the, the best known ones, Bedrich Fritta and, and Norbert Troller uh, and Leo Haas, uh, they all worked in these technical, uh, in a technical department where they, uh, they worked officially as artists and were able to, to have uh, art supplies. And after hours, they created these works that documented uh, the true life in Terezin. Unfortunately, uh, they were discovered, and five of them were sent to the small fortress, which was the prison next to Terezin, and four of them perished. And also, uh, I'd like to mention Alfred Cantor. Mm -hmm. uh, he, um, He's known as a Terezin artist, but he was also deported to Auschwitz and Schwarzheide. And on, on his uh, liberation, he produced uh, 127 watercolors and sketches, which he published in a book called uh, The Book of Alfred Cantor, which was published in this country and is available. And his work is so important because it provides a pictorial a uh, document record of camps like Auschwitz and, uh, and Schwarzheide of, you know, there's, for a filmmaker to make a film about the Holocaust, there's always a problem because there is no visual documentation, or hardly any, of Auschwitz and other camps. So the, his work is extremely important. It was shown at MoMA and at the Center for Jewish History, and I've used it in both of my films. Mm -hmm. I, th I think that the art side of it is very interesting because if you look at the contrast between the, the work that the artists were doing officially, which was basically propaganda material for the, for the regime and their incredibly sort of accurate drawings of, sort of welding and, and things like that, um, uh, and then contrast that with the, the, the pictures that they did in their free time of what was really going on. It's, it, it's an extraordinary contrast between the two sort of images. Talking about the, the music, obviously music doesn't chronicle and record in the same way uh, as art does. Um, and there's sort of two types of music that were written in Terezin. Um, some of it is commenting about what was, what was going on. Um, obviously the cabaret that, that Zdenko was involved in that was very much about the circumstances there. There was an opera written there called The Emperor of, of Atlantis, which is a sort of satirical piece about the situation, not just in Terezin, but in, in um, Nazi Germany. Uh, so there was that music that was sort of referring to, to the environment, but then there was music that was escapism, and uh, certainly there's, there's lots, of, lots of music which, which is just great music that could have been written anywhere. I'm thinking of, say, something like the, the Ullman Quartet, which was played in the concert last night. There's nothing in that music that's about Terezin or about the conditions. It's, it's a fine piece of 20th century chamber music, which mm. could have been written had he emigrated. In fact, he came to London um, just before the war for performances. Had he managed to escape, you know, it's just the sort of piece he might have written had he 
escape to, to England or to America. Right. We're going to see another clip from Zuzanov's film that uh, talks about the art teacher Friedel Dicker Brandeis, who was a well-known artist at Terezin who gave art classes to the children. And we're also going to see some footage from the children's opera Brundabar, which was written and performed in Terezin. Uh, before we do, Zdenka, I wondered if as a performer, you might say something about what it was like to perform under these circumstances. Well, it had a very modest beginning. Don't forget that amongst the multitude of Czech Jews that came to Terezin, which was three quarters of the population, were professional actors, directors, writers, uh, designers who uh, represented the cultural life before the war in Prague, which was very rich. They all came in. And of course, there was an urge to perform and to do something. And uh, there was a fear, what will the Germans say? So very, very slowly, poetry was being read in the ethics and so on and so on. Until it got to the ears of the uh, Jewish management or what was it, uh, uh, council, mm -hmm. who uh, decided everything. It was like, it was very well uh, governed town. It was like a small Israel, I would say. Mm. There were departments for absolutely everything. So also there was the department for arts. And uh, it happened that it got to the ears of the Germans and they said, yes, why not? Let them play and sing. Let's call it Kameraden Abende, which was meant uh, friendly evenings. And that was green light. Mm. We got green light, and from then on, it went absolutely, everybody was there. Immediately on the ethics, which were huge space, theaters were being built, wooden benches, stage, lights. Uh, there were people for everything. Uh, immediately, there were people who started to write uh, either plays or, or uh, um, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, cabarets. The cabaret, yeah. uh, one, was, one group was highly political, dangerous. The other one was local, satirical, very funny. And uh, the idea, of course, for us was wonderful. We, we, can, we can perform and play and so on. But of course, we didn't realize that underneath was the German cynicism. They knew we were all sentenced to death. And so they thought, let them play, let them smile, let them do everything. It, it will come. Well, they were right in the end, but we didn't know it. And so we danced under the gallows, practically. Um, can we have clip number two, please? Because I had no mother the, uh, and no woman who really uh, oh, had close feelings towards me. And so I always looked for somebody whom I loved specially. And that was our teacher in drawing, Riedel Dicker Brandeis. She was from the Bauhaus, and she was a fantastic painter. She never let us draw anything which we saw in Terezin. It always had to do something with a nice world. Come, I show you a picture which I made. This one on top. Friedel, we called her Friedel, left one transport before me to Auschwitz and didn't return. Do Terezína přišli všichni. Tam přišli spisovatelé, umělci, vědci, 
A teď každý zase sám ze sebe vydal a předával dál to nejlepší, co měl. Tam bylo soustředěný na tom malém prostoru tolik kultury, že je to těžko asi pro někoho, kdo tam nebyl, ze pochopit. We had a lot of very gifted girls in my home, especially musically. When the children's opera Brundiva was uh, being produced, uh, Ella, uh, Ella Stein, now Weisberger, was over the whole time the cat. I was the one in the black outfit. I had my sister's ski pants. My mother was in mourning, so she gave me her black sweater. And I can see a couple children that I remember. Have you seen this edition of the Brunjibar score? I, no, this is, this I never saw. This is my line. Já v noci vidím, já v noci slídím. Obsah té opery je samozřejmě velice jednoduché, je to taková jednoduchá povídka o těch dvou dětech, jak schánějí pro maminku mlíko. A nakonec přemůžou toho zlýho Brundibára. Nikoho už dneska nikdo asi dneska nepochopí, co to pro nás tehdy znamenalo, protože ten Brundibár bylo to stělesnění toho zla, který ty děti porazili. Konečná píseň, že ten konečný refrém, tam Brundibár poražen, my jsme to vyhráli, mělo takový ohromný význam. I dneska, kdekoliv ve světě lidi se sejdou, který tam byli, tak když zaspívají toho Brundibára, tak každý na to reaguje. I think maybe Ella is in the audience. I, I'm not sure. Um. Susanna, can you talk a little bit about what it was like to see Brundabar in the camp? Um, I think we, uh, uh, the Czech children, just loved Brundabar, and we still, we still all love it. You, you could see that in the, in my film. But I would like to point out at this at this moment that. Uh, there was a great divide between Czech children and German children. I, I think most of the artists and musicians we're talking about tonight are Czech Jews, and this is something that should be mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, it was difficult to get tickets for Brunjibar. It, it, it was difficult to get tickets for everything. Um, I was very fortunate because my best friend, uh, sang the role of the, of the dog. And so I, I, I was just there every night and I, I knew the whole opera and I kept trying out and then finally, toward the end, I, I sang in the chorus three times. But it, it had great meaning for us, as, as Helga explains. It, Brunjibar uh, Porajan, he's defeated, that was Hitler. And it, but quite apart from that, it, the, the music is just so charming and so easy to love. It was a moment of great joy and pleasure.
amidst great difficulties. Simon, do you have any thoughts on why Brundabar has had such staying power? Yeah, I've seen Brundabar several times. Um, the music is very good. I think I think Krasser is is probably the most interesting of the composers who is in in Terezin. Um, what's great about it is is it's very melodic, but it's also very spiky, um, with lots of sort of dissonance in it, um, uh, a sort of slightly diff dissonant edge. Um, and, and it's very funny. And I think some of the productions I've seen um, sort of make the mistake of, of, because of the circumstances, making it rather sentimental. And it's not a sentimental piece. It's a very gutsy, um, uh, funny, amusing piece. And, and that's really the way it should be, should be seen. It, it is performed quite often in this country and all over the world. Sometimes it was on Broadway and it was quite overproduced, I thought. And I'm, I'm always wishing that somebody would do the production exactly the same way it was done in Terezin with the sets by Zelenka, who was well... Uh, there was um, a production well, that I filmed for BBC that was sort of based on those designs. It wasn't copying those g designs, but it was sort of inspired by the Zelenka and, designs. And there, there is that uh, fence in the back, and the chorus stood that was hidden behind the fence, and when we sang, we, we stepped on a box and our heads bobbed up. Hmm. Zdenka, do you have memories of seeing Brundabar in Terezin? Not much. I was too busy. Because <laughs> <laughs> apart from the theater, we all had to work. Mm -hmm. And I don't even remember when I slept. So uh, Brundabar I have seen once. And uh, well, it was a jolly performance, and of course, but what I, what I find now that Brunjiba has been uh, played all over the world and uh, as far as Japan and so on, and it's being given a different significance, as though they would suggest that it was a place of resistance. It wasn't. The, the play came already ready-made uh, long before the war, or before Terezin, and it was really only play for children about children, and there was nothing else behind it. I, I have a, a little detail to add at Please. this time. <clears throat> uh, I don't think this is known, but at, we Jewish children were not allowed to go to school after, I think, 1940, and most of us went to the Jewish school in Prague, and when that closed, by then many children were in Terezin already, the Jewish community opened three centers for children in Prague. And we had a competition to put on a play. And my center put on a Czech play called Students and Teachers, and we thought we were fantastic. <laughs> but we lost. <laughs> <laughs> because the orphanage uh, center, there was a center at the orphanage put on Brunibar. Mm. And they won. Oh, I absolutely. And I think that was the premiere of Brunibar. Mm. It was toward, it was the winter of 42, 43 or something like that. I think one of the important things, and uh, I mean, Zdenka, you worked with Zelenka, was, was how with limited resources and a lot of imagination, an incredible amount was done because he designed uh, well, costumes for Z something Zelenka, you were in. Zelenka, Franciszek Zelenka, who was already a very famous scenic designer in Prague before the war. At with, the so-called liberated with, with theater, our, yeah with one of the most That was Voskovets uh, and Derek for those who... Theater, yeah. the liberated theater, very creative man, very witty. And uh, he was given a work, workshop, no, you call it workshop, mm -hmm. where he could build scenery, uh, got material for costumes and uh, paintings and so on. Of course, there was a shortage of material. Uh, the most materials were sheets, unfortunately, for people who died. So he, he could use a lot of that and color it. There was paper, there was uh, straw, uh, there was wood, all this sort of thing. But he was so such a genius that he created most fantastic scenery and costumes mm. um, in, for every play. In, in, in this segment, uh, uh, Helga Kinski talks about Friedel Dicke Brandeis and the nice world that she wanted to, children to create. She taught them 
the rhythm and beauty that should be in art, which is in direct contrast to, uh, to what Helga Hoshkova's father told her, draw what you see. Right. Whereas Friedel Dicker Brandeis tried to help the children escape reality. Right. It just well shows how many different possibilities there are for art anywhere, really. Um, so the next clip that we're going to see actually has some extraordinary footage of one of the original productions of Brunderbar in Terezin. This is a propaganda film that was made by the Nazis to show off to the Red Cross and to the world what a, what a model town Terezin was. And the film was called The Fuhrer Gives a Town to the Jews. And it was, it was staged, obviously, in um, a very deceptive way to make it appear to the world as if Hitler was somehow protecting these Jews by having set up a special town for them. And I wonder if before we see this clip, if any of you have anything to add before we, before we take a look at these scenes. Mm. Now, there was quite a preparation. Mm. Do you remember how? For, before they came. Mm -hmm. Women were uh, given buckets with water and, and uh, brush to kneel down and, and scrub the, the walks, and nobody was allowed to walk on it anymore. Shops in the street, which were used for, for people to sleep in, because there was a shortage of space, you can imagine, they were all sent to the east. The shops were uh, being decorated with things that they found in the suitcases. So everything had to be right. Uh, there was a strict rule when the uh, filmmakers will come. Nobody is coming near them. It was strictly forbidden. No questions asked and no answers at all. Uh, young girl who were, living, who were working in the um, uh, uh, vegetable gardens for the Germans were given an order to scrub themselves clean, make themselves nice, uh, 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 spade over their shoulders and march through town singing happily. This is the happiest place in the world. So uh, it was all stage managed mm -hmm. uh, in but the you, end. You were filmed, weren't you, Stenka? Beg your pardon? You were filmed. I was filmed. <laughs> There was a river outside, Oja, and uh, a group of us were assigned to swim across the river and back. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. But I don't remember, I really honestly can't recollect. We didn't have a swimsuit, we weren't naked, we, we, we were not in, under, I don't know what we were wearing, mm -hmm. but we swam. I'd like to add that before uh, the filming, uh, 7,500 people were deported to Auschwitz to, to make Terezin look less crowded. Yeah, that's what I and said from the uh, also, um, shop windows. Also, um, uh, when you see the children on swings, they, they built a pavilion for children. And we were never allowed to enter it, but there was a big area there where after uh, the filming, I used to meet my friends after work and we, we played ball there, but were never able to, to mm. enter the pavilion. On the, the other side, the, 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 the film, A, it was never shown, it wasn't finished. It, it, it was shot in the summer of 1944 and um, hadn't been finished by 1945, at the end of the war. Um, and of course, one of the good things about the film is that actually it, does record some of the performances that happened there, like the fragment of Brundibar right. um, and an excellent piece by, by Pavel Haas called Study for Strings. So, so, you know, although the whole thing is a fictional documentary, some real documentary elements are inside it. Right. So well, let's, let's see this clip now. We're going to, uh, we'll see the footage, and in the background, Helga Hoshkova and Helga Kinski are reading from their diaries in voiceover.
Monday, November 29th, 1943. The whole ghetto has to be beautified. Přijede prý mezinárodní komise. Je již připraven plán, kudy má komise projít. Podle toho se pracuje. Ovšem do dneška ne nemůžem pochopit, jak to i bylo možné, že se dala natolik obalamutit tím, co jí bylo ukázáno. Ale to, co jim tam připravili, bylo skutečně modelový ghetto. Byla to na lž lži propaganda i ten film, který byl natočený, dává úplně zkreslený a falešný dojem o Terezínu. Na to byli vybíraný zvlášť lidi, zdravě ještě nějak vypadající, a dokonce lidi, kteří vypadali zase nějak zvlášť špatně a nemocně, tak ty ještě předtím z toho geta už zlikvidovali. Postavili tam hudební pavilon a pro děti se tam postavilo hřiště. Ty děti v životě hřiště neviděli. Ty děti tam dostali ten den svačinu, v životě nejedli ten chleba předtím ani potom. Bylo to divadlo na jeden den a divadlo skončilo a v razi stahla se opona a děti odjeli transportem. The last performance of Flowers was filmed in the, for the propaganda film. And uh, after this, there were big transports and most of the children that they sang in Brondipa were sent to gas chambers and didn't come back. Susanna, was there something else that you wanted to say about the film? Well, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, this uh, propaganda film is used very often by filmmakers about Terezin, and it's very important uh, for them to say that it's a propaganda film, which they don't always do. Mm. Can I say something more about the preparations? Yes, please. There was a coffee house equipped with um, tables and everything, and people were ordered to sit there and enjoy themselves with cups of coffee or pretending cups of coffee. And well, they all looked very sad. They, they didn't quite <laughs> enjoy themselves at all. Outside, park was being equipped with cities and so on, people should promenade and look happy and chat. Well, they didn't quite, because that, that was difficult to do. But one of the very nasty things that they did was children from the children's homes were gathered to the commandant. His name was Ram. And at that time it was filmed each child got a tin of sardines. The sardines was something very special. That was allowed because Portugal, Portugal and Germany made a, care, made a pact uh, as a special treat to be sent to some people from outside, of course. Sardines were not for eating, they were for sale because with sardines you could buy cigarettes or whatever. In this scene, Ang the, uh, Ram was giving all the children uh, tins of sardines, and they were ordered to say, more or less sing, Ah, Uncle Ram, schon wieder sardinen. That means Uncle Ram, again sardines. <laughs> and that was filmed. The nasty thing was, after the film it was over, these children all were sent east. Gone. So, you see, the, it, it had a background. Yeah. Um, 
I'm not completely sure that that story, that may be an apocryphal story. We, we don't have, I mean, it's certainly not in the film now. Um, I'm not sure. Well, let's, uh, uh, maybe I wonder if we could uh, move on from Brundabar to some other of the musicians and composers who were at work in the camp. Simon, can you give a bit of a, an introduction to some of those other major composers? Yeah, th there, there are essentially four main composers who, who, who were there. Um, Krasa, who wrote Brundibar, was, was one of them. Um, the, four, the four composers were Hans Krasa, uh, Victor Ullmann, who, they were both about 40 by the time they got to Terezin, um, so had, had already established careers. Um, Ullmann had written several pieces, um, operas and pieces which were performed in Prague. Um, Krasser had written a symphony which was actually premiered by the um, Boston Symphony Orchestra. Um, so these were, they weren't well-known names, but they were, they were people who were emerging on the international scene. And can you talk uh, about some of the different genres that were used well, in the camp? Well, Ull Ullmann was, was a pupil of Schoenberg and worked with Zemlinsky. Now, if you know the music of those people, it's, it's very Viennese. They were part of what's called the Second Viennese School. Now, Schoenberg was the, the pioneer, really, of, of um, atonal music. Now, Ullmann didn't go down that route. His music clearly is in that ex expressionist world um, that, that, say, Schoenberg and Berg inhabited. But he, he keeps the, um, the sort of links to tonality. And I would say he's very Viennese in the way that he follows classical models. So he follows the traditional forms of classical music and he writes variations and fugues and all those sorts of things. Uh, that's Ullmann. Krasser was, was a rather more um, sort of uh, hard to pigeonhole composer. Um, uh, a lady called Alice Hertz Sommer, who was a, um, a pianist who was still alive, who, who was in the film that I did, she knew Krasser a little bit, um, and she sort of says that he was a bit of a dilettante. He came from quite a rich family. He, he didn't need to earn a living, and so she rather criticized him for jumping around and, and not really sort of dedicating himself to, to, to composing. But he was the guy who, who wrote the music for the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He wrote Brundy Bar. He wrote a lot of fantastic chamber music. And I think some of it is, is the most powerful music that was written in Terezin. The other composer, also around the same age, so about 40 when he went to, to, um, to Terezin, was Pavel Haas. He came from Brno, the, the second city in, in um, uh, Czechoslovakia, and he was a pupil of Janáček, Janáček being the best-known Czech composer um, of, of the pre-war period. Janáček died in 1928, so he didn't um, live, live to the war. But I would say Pavel Haas was very much a disciple of Janáček. You can hear the connection in the music. and. Um, it's very often said in the sort of music history books that, that there was no school of Janáček, as it were. He didn't have followers and disciples. Well, actually, Haas was part of the school of Janáček. The sad thing is that, you know, people don't know about him because he, he died in Auschwitz. Um, he, again, had written uh, an opera, at least one opera before <laughs> the war, which had won a, uh, a prize. Um, so, and, and, and written lovely chamber music, and in fact, one of the string quartets uh, that, that Pavel Haas wrote is being played by um, the Nash this, this week. Um, and that's, that's a string quartet he actually wrote before he um, went to Terezin, uh, but very much in the sort of Janáček mold. Then the, other, the fourth composer who, of, of, this sort of, of the major composers in Terezin was much younger. He, he was, I can't remember, 18 or something, 18, 19, when, when he got to, to Terezin. Uh, Gideon Klein, uh, he lived in Prague and uh, composed some wonderful music there, the, uh, the string trio that was played last night. Uh, and several several other pieces, and he was also very active as a pianist and involved in in the music 
pr productions. Um, they also, for a long time, they didn't realize, they, they thought really he'd only started composing in Terezin with the, the sort of opportunities he had there. But actually, not so long ago, 10, 15 years ago, um, they discovered in Prague um, a locked suitcase of quite a lot of compositions of his before he went to Terezin. So he'd actually been quite busy as a composer with, with pieces before he, he got to Terezin. Well, let's see. Our next clip is from your film, a clip of the pianist Alice Hertz Summer talking about what it was like to perform concert, uh, as a concert pianist in Terezin. And it ends with an excerpt from Krasa's Tanz, or Dance. Kaiser von Atlantis zazní dole parafráze na německou hymnu. Ovšem ta je tak skrytá, ta německá hymna, že si to divák vlastně uvědomí jenom, když je veliký muzikant a vyzná se v notách. Kaiser von Atlantis se nastudovala, narežírovala, došlo to až ke generálce a pak, když to SSáci viděli, až oni museli na generálce být, tak to zakázali, poněvadž poznali, že se jedná o Hitlera, ten Kaiser von Atlantis. Je to vlastně zánik toho, Císaře neboli Hitlera, který podá se té smrti, která si ho pak veme. A vedení SSácký to nepovolilo dál. To, co držím v ruce, je part, na kterém stojí Viktor Ullmann, Kaiser von Atlantis oder die Tod vor Weigerung, der Tod, pomlka, Karel Berman. Tohle jsem si tenkrát sám opisoval z partitury a do dneska se to zachovalo z Terezína. Je to poprvé, co to ukazuju lidem.
Well, forgive me for misleading you. That was not the film clip that I was <laughs> expecting. But uh, Simon, perhaps it, it does somewhat explain itself. Sure. But maybe you could say something about yeah. this opera, The Emperor of Atlantis. And That's The Emperor of Atlantis, yeah. written by Victor Ullman. It's the piece I mentioned earlier as an example of a piece written, inspired by the circumstances in, in Terezin. Um, what I think is really, well, there's two things you see in there. W one is the sort of satirical version of the, um, of the German national anthem. Um, and then s secondly, um, I think much, certainly much more beautiful is that aria by death. Um, it's like Richard Strauss or something with these lovely, gorgeous, rich harmonies and sort of soaring violin lines. Um, and I think what's really interesting about it is, is in the whole opera, it's death that has the most attractive, the most um, lyrical music, like he's the most sort of attractive figure in the opera in a way, and uh, it's, it's something that's really, really very telling. Can I say what happened to the score? Yes, please. Because it was never performed. Mm. As he said, it was yes. stopped at the dress rehearsal. Mm -hmm. The score has been preserved somewhere behind bricks for 30 years. A historian in London, a German Jewish historian, got hold of it, and for the first time after 30 years after the war, it was performed in Holland, mm -hmm. then in London, the Mecklenburg, yeah, yes, Mecklenburg came. actually weren't the first to do it in London. Then but long Boston. time nothing, yeah. and two years ago here in Boston. So it took quite some time, and uh, last year was again in London. It's yeah, it's a piece that that has now you know entered the repertoire to to an extent and. Uh, um, it was done in Vienna, too, quite yes. early on. So he was very much discovery. ahead of time. Mm. It's a short piece, isn't it? It is. It's a one, that's sort a of problem. one act. It's a one, it's one got hour. To be, it's got to be... It has to be produced coupled with something, with something else. else. Yes. And how yeah. does it hold up now as an opera? Well, it, 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 you know, there are pieces in Terezin which, in a way, you can take them out of the context um, and just perform them as pieces of music. I think with, with The Emperor of Atlantis, you can't really take it out of its context. It's so much about the, 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 in, the environment and what yeah. happened there. But it, it, in a way, I mean, that doesn't invalidate it, but what, what, it, what it stands up as is, is a remarkable achievement of, of something that, that's commenting on in, in a very intelligent way. And it's not literal, it's, it's very imaginative, the way that it, mm. uh, it, it takes its story. Um, the libretto was, was written by a guy called Peter Keane, who did a lot of fantastic drawings uh, in Terezin as well. Uh, and the, the, the libretto, it's not like the opera is about the daily life in, in Terezin. It's, it, it's taken away from that. It's much more alle allegorical. It's a sort of strange fantasy allegory, and it's very imaginative. Can you comment a little on the very dramatic staging that we see in your film? Um, this, this is based on the, the Mecklenburg Opera. Mecklenburg was a, a, a company based in London who uh, looked at some of these unusual operas. They did, first of all, um, the, the Emperor of Atlantis. Uh, they, the, they just had very imaginative ideas and really good musicians involved. Um, you know, the idea of, of death being a sort of old-fashioned, you know, old-fashioned German soldier, um, you know, it's just a, a, nice, a nice idea and this crazy, mad sort of Hitler figure, the emperor that they had, the Kaiser. Um, so they did, they did the Emperor of Atlantis. They, they, I, I just chose four or five excerpts which I used for the, for the documentary based on their production, um, but they, they did do the, the whole opera. And they also were the people who did Brundibar, which mm. was sort of inspired by the, the fence and the, the things that, that Zelenka did in, in Terezin. And, and they very deliberately, you know, used very simple ideas in a way because that, those were the circumstances in, in Terezin. 
I mean, the common theme that we see in both these works, the Emperor of Atlantis and Brunivar, obviously they're extremely different, but the common theme is that they both have triumphalist endings. And I, obviously that's not an accident. I wonder if any of you have thoughts about, uh, about the meanings of these, these works. I, I, I mean, as Denka said, I, I, I don't think one needs to read too much into Brundibar and the meaning of Brundibar. It's a good hmm. triumphs over evil story. You know, that's, that's it. Um, there's a lot more to, to, to the Emperor of Atlantis. You know, there's, there's satire in there. There's, there's, um, there's also musical references to all sorts of things. I mean, aside from the, the German national anthem, the, the piece ends with an extraordinary Bach-like chorale, um, when ba basically the you know everyone is welcoming the return of death. I mean, j just to say very quickly what the, the the plot is that with with this mad emperor Hitler, um, who's who's fighting wars on every front all, all over the world, um, in protest, death gives up working so so people can't die anymore uh, and what happens is that eventually with all these people being being slaughtered and not dying um, everyone pleads for for death to come back and return to work which he agrees to do uh, on the condition that the emperor is his first victim so it's it you know it's 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 a very brave and and um, sort of uh, incredible imaginative thing to, to come up with under those, under those circumstances. And, and the end of the piece, which we do film in the, in the documentary, is, is extraordinarily powerful with this Bach chorale. And I, I sort of love the way that, that all these composers referred to musical history. Um, and it's very often, you know, German musical history, a great figure like Bach and you know the, none of these composers are saying well you know we don't want anything to do with German music they see themselves as part of this tradition of, of German music and, and um, Ullmann particularly is, is quoting Bach um, and then a lot of a lot of the composers a common thing is using Czech music that has a sort of resistance um, ingredient to it like the, the the chorales that were the Hussite chorales that were you know very important in raising a sort of Czech national spirit there, something that gets into a lot of the pieces. Ullmann, particularly, again, used those in, in his music. Good. We have a couple of questions from audience members. Um, one, I guess, Zdenka, I think this one is for you. Um, you mentioned that Terezin was one of the freest places in Nazi Germany. Can you say a little bit more about what that means? Well, it meant that within the walls of Terezin, we were actually free. We could move freely around. We could uh, behave. We could play uh, theater, music, and everything, and uh, meet each other. Whereas outside, we were completely restricted. After 8 o'clock, nothing, shopping, uh, only after four o'clock when there was nothing in, in the shops to buy, no food, no school, no nothing. You couldn't m meet m neighbors or school friends. And there was a complete no. So um, within the walls of Terezin, um, because the majority were Czech Jews, we were actually on our own national territory. And all of us, were hoping that, you know, there were always rumors. And rumors were, for instance, uh, Germany is losing the war on the Russian border, and in two months' time, the war is over. So, two months' time, we can, we can handle it. After two months' time, there was no end, so we prolonged it another two months, and so it went. And we all hoped that it will be possible that we shall stay in Terezin until the end of the war, then we return back home and start where we finished. Well, it never happened. Mm. But so it was also free in the sense that the Nazis didn't care what the Jews did, so 
there was no uh, censorship, and they, they couldn't understand Czech, most of them couldn't understand Czech anyway, so that you could produce plays in Terezin that you could not do in the protectorate, in, in outside of uh, uh, occupied, uh, in occupied Czechoslovakia. In Terezin, for instance, people were allowed to have musical instruments. Outside at home, no. So there was a big difference. So we really were much freer, uh, and I would say almost completely, of course not completely, but almost, uh, much more than outside. And so it's the Emperor of Atlantis and also one, one of the cabarets that you mentioned, um, there was a cabaret called The Last Cyclist, Amazing. which was a again, a satirical cabaret, was, was another one that was banned. But I think those are the only two examples of things But it was banned by the Jewish <laughs> administration. Because it was a preventive banning. It was not banned by the yeah, Germans. No. Why yeah. was it banned? The, uh, 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 the last cyclist, it, it's a satire on the Germans. Uh, it's a, I think it's a persecution of cyclists. <laughs> so yeah. The idea of the last cyclist was that there that, that was a very uh, bad leader again who was waging war all over the place. And he hated cyclists. And uh, blaming, blaming the cyclists mm. for being the reason. So they had to make a list of all cyclists with the difference of cyclists who two generations before were pedestrians. <laughs> <laughs> and so all of them had to be uh, uh, taken out of the country and uh, taken to an island called the Island of Hora, which they were. And amongst them was one, Morris Abeles, who thought, I'm not going to that island, and jumped over and swam. But they caught him, brought him back, and uh, displayed him as the last cyclist in, in a cage. But in the end, uh, he got uh, freedom and said, um, it was said, uh, you, you, will, you, you can have your last, last wish um, sitting near a rocket. And the management came he should have been sent to the, uh, to the stratosphere and gave him a last wish. And he said, a trembling hand, I would like a cigarette. And they gave him the lighter, and as he switched the lighter on, he switched on some, and some, some of the electricity or whatever uh, of the... Uh, the rocket. The rocket, and uh, the management flew into the air and he stayed behind. And, that was a happy and the play will be soon published in the collection of, of Terezin Cabarets and Plays edited by Lisa Peschel. It will come out in the spring. And you, you said that was banned by the Jewish elders. Was that because they, 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 they thought worried. it was too dangerous? They worried, yeah. They, they tried to prevent it. Mm. Mm. But this play was, uh, was seen by the Jewish uh, elders. Mm -hmm. At, uh, after one South performance, South and they mm -hmm. said, ah, no, no, mm -hmm. no, this is too dangerous. If, if it would come to the notice of the Germans, we are lost and there will be more transport, so nothing. Did they normally pre-screen the performances that took the place? The Germans, no, no, they didn't No, the understand. Jewish elders. Yes, oh yes. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a complete department, Freizeit Gestaltung, which was the Ministry of um, Free, Entertainment. Entertainment, that's right. Hmm. We have another logistical question. Susanna, this is something you cover in your film that we didn't get to. How did artists manage to keep their work during their time in the camp? I, I, sorry, how did we... How did artists manage to keep their work? Oh, um, well, um, they, the, uh, the work that was... Um, uh, that was produced, that, uh, that um, documented life in Terezin was generally hidden. And um, uh, Helga Hushkova uh, um, 
when, when she left, uh, she produced 100 drawings in Jerezin. And when she left for Auschwitz, uh, her, her uncle uh, uh, hid all of her drawings and her diary in a wall. And uh, this was not a work of art, but Helga Kinski's wonderful diary was buried in the basement of, of, her, of her father's building. So, uh, and all the, all the children's, all the children's uh, uh, drawings that were produced under the guidance of Friedrich Brandeis were saved by a man who, who was in charge of that children's home. And there are some similar stories also about the musical scores yeah. that were produced in the yeah, camp. Yeah, I mean, ba basically, if if people took the any music scores with them on the transports, they haven't survived. Um, Haas took some of the compositions that he wrote in Terezin. We know he wrote them, but we don't have the music, and it's assumed that he took those with him when he when he was transported. So the pieces that have survived are those that were left in Terezin in a similar way. They were, they were hidden. Um, it's interesting, the study for strings of, of Haas, he presumably took the, um, the full score with him, but all the parts were left in, in Terezin, and so that piece was reconstructed from the, the separate string parts. Mm. Similar and to the, the way some known... of your subjects rewrote their diaries after the war. Um, well, uh, Michael Krauss, I, somehow I can't hear you that well. Was it about Michael Krauss? Right, rewriting yeah. his diary he, after he, the war. He, unfortunately, he's such a great diary keeper until now, but unfortunately he took his diary with him to Auschwitz, where of course it was confiscated. But right upon return, he reconstructed his diary. And Helga Hoshkova uh, also reconstructed the part, because the diaries only cover Terezin because once they left Terezin, they couldn't, couldn't keep diaries. So when uh, Helga Hoshkova was liberated, she also reconstructed the part that covers the time from uh, the time that she left Terezin for Auschwitz. Good. Well, before we wrap up, I have one last note here. It's not a question, but a note from a survivor in the audience who wants to know if anybody else is here who was in Terezin at the same time as he was uh, from March 1943 until May 15th, 1944, Martin Hilsenrat would like to meet you after the talk is over. So please look for him in the lobby if you are in Terezin between March 1943 and May 1944. And please join me in thanking all of our panelists for a wonderful discussion. Thank you.